Hi, everyone. It is now 105, so we are going to get this started. Let me quickly set up things here, make sure I'm sharing my sound. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our July 17th meeting. Um, our meeting today is going to be talking about small fruits for the home garden. Uh, I am Casey Hummeldorf. I'm the Girl Scout who's been um, holding these workshops. Um, I have had the honor of working with the Mass Park City Library and working with the um, Prince William Master Gardeners. And they have been such help trying to get the trying to get um, this project started, trying to get all this gardening information out to you guys. Um, Valerie, if you would care to talk more about the library. Sure. Hi guys, welcome. My name is Valerie. Um, I work here at the Manassas Park City Library. We are fairly new. Um, we're coming up on our one year anniversary. Uh, next month, August 4th. Um, so we were really excited when Casey approached us um, to partner uh, with the library for her um, project that she's working on for the Girl Scouts. So in addition to the um, online workshop series that we're hosting, we also installed a free seed library um, in the outside of the library in the back right corner along the Bloom's Trail. So it has a lot of different seeds. You can leave seeds, take seeds. It's got a lot of good information in there as well. So uh, personally, I was really excited to work with uh, Casey on her project. Um, I'm a big gardener myself, and I am always thrilled to help uh, bring the love of gardening to other people. So uh, Casey, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it on back to you. All right, thank you, Valerie. And again, guys, uh, the Manassas Park Library has such great people working for it. I highly encourage you guys to go check out the seed box as well as go check out the library. Everyone's been so nice and kind. Just, and they're celebrating what they're nearly celebrating one year. So maybe help them out and get a book to celebrate. <laughs> um, so overview of the workshop and rules today. Um, introductions are you done. Watch the small fruits for the home gardening video provided by the VCE Master Gardeners. That'll take around 35 minutes. Um, add on final remarks and announcements. Now, I know I wrote down roughly 10 minutes, but might lean more towards the 20, 25 minutes. Um, and then we'll do Q&A in closing for five minutes or however long. Um, that takes with how many questions you guys have. Um, rules and discussions. Please keep muted during the videos and put your questions in the chat. Uh, no spamming the chat. I, um, I, I know that's, that's a stupid rule, but I've worked with low kids. Um, I've worked on Zooms with low kids, so just that's a general rule that I put out. Um, sessions will be recorded and put up and upload it onto YouTube. If you don't feel comfortable with being recorded, you are free to leave. We thank you so much for just coming in and stopping by and um, we will let you know, we will notify you when the um, video is put up onto the YouTube, onto YouTube. Those, small fruit. So today's video is gonna be small fruits for the home garden. Um, again, this video is provided by the Prince William Master Gardeners. And uh, yeah, Valerie, if you could give me a signal if you hear it or not. Hey everyone, it's 11 o'clock. We're gonna get started here with small fruit for the home garden. My name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the ag agent here in Prince William County. Presentation I put together, but it also was contributed to by Ashley Appling and Kirsten Conrad who uh, also work here in the Northern District. When we're talking about fruit, there are a number of things that we want to consider. Uh, one is how hardy are they for zones 7A and 7B, or if you're not in those zones, whatever hardiness zone you're in. How susceptible is the fruit that you're looking at to disease and insects? 
And sometimes that depends on the species you're looking at. Sometimes it depends on the variety. And then sometimes it depends really on where you're located. And then how much pruning does the given fruit need? And how much work are you willing to put into doing that pruning to make sure you get a good crop? Is the plant self-pollinating or does it need cross-pollination? There are a number of fruits that need two or more varieties together in order to cross-pollinate. There are a few that can self-pollinate and some of those self-pollinating ones actually do better when are cross-pollinated. How big is this fruit going to be? And when I say the fruit, I'm talking about the plant. You know, do you have space for it? Is it one of those plants that might get away from you, like some of our brambles? And do you have the right type of sun? Depending on what fruit you're looking at, there are some fruits that can handle some shade, but most of our fruits are going to look for six to eight hours of direct sun daily. So another thing to consider is chill hours, and chill hours are basically the number of hours cold that a plant needs in order to produce fruit the following year. And these are some examples of different things and the, the different uh, chill hours they need. If we look closer at the map, we're looking at hourly temperatures between freezing and 45 degrees. Now these are averages, so when you're looking at a particular variety, if it needs 1,200 chill hours and you're in the southern part of Georgia, that plant's not going to produce for you. So you have to be aware of the chill hours. This is usually more important with our, our tree fruits. But some of our small fruits, this is, this is a problem with if you get the wrong variety. So when we look at types of fruit, one of the ways we break fruits down is large fruits versus small fruits. When we're talking about large fruits, we're typically talking about fruit that grows on trees, although not exclusively. Uh, and the two most common types of large fruit that we see in the U.S. are stone fruits, which are also called droops, palm fruits. But the focus of what we're doing today is small fruits because here in Northern Virginia, small fruits are much better suited to the home garden because there are fewer pest issues and they get into full production more quickly than large fruits. The problem with a lot of our tree fruits is they need about five years of growth once they've been planted before they're going to produce significantly. Our small fruits usually can produce within a couple years. Stone fruits are basically peaches, plums, nectarines, apricots, almonds, uh, cherries, dates, mangoes, and olives are sort of in this group. Um, we don't use them in Northern Virginia in the backyard because they tend to have a lot of disease issues. Uh, they have some pest issues, but disease is significant. There are some exotic cherries that might be better suited than our traditional sweet cherries, but generally speaking, stone fruits disease is a big issue. And our palm fruits, which apples, pears, loquats, and quince, they also have disease issues as well. Where we are, it's a lot of scab, a lot of rust, and if you've got cedar trees around you, you do not want palm fruits because cedar apple rust and cedar quince rust are major diseases and basically what happens is the disease bounces back and forth year to year from one plant to another. Here in Northern Virginia, if you want to grow really nice palm fruits, you're looking at a pesticide spray schedule of about 15 applications. If you want to go organic with that, you're looking at 45. And so for a lot of people, palm fruits really aren't a good choice. And that's why we recommend small fruits. And so let's look a little bit more closely at that. So with small fruits, we're looking at blueberries, blackberries, elderberry, raspberries, strawberries, currants, cranberries, mulberries, grapes, and a few others. Currants aren't very well suited to our area for reasons which we'll get into a little bit later. Cranberries, we're a little south for cranberries. Our non-native grapes tend to be really diseasy, and so they're not really great for Northern Virginia. If you live here in Northern Virginia, you know that there are a lot of wineries here. Those wineries spend an awful lot on pest control. Um, and that's why they're better suited for wineries and less suited for our backyards. So let's start with strawberries. Basically with strawberries, we space them out two feet apart in rows that are three to three and a half foot apart. Uh, usually they are white blooming, although sometimes you get pink flowers. 
and they bloom from late spring to the end of summer. Strawberries, to keep them in the peak of production, you want to replace the plants every three years. Usually the first year with strawberries, there's a lot of growth and not a lot of actual berry production. Strawberries actually like to be crowded, so you want to try it and let them grow together. You also want to keep weeds down. Strawberries do not do well competing against weeds. Now there are two types of strawberries. June bearing strawberries, which fruit in May to June, and ever bearing, which fruit from May to September. And depending on what you're looking for, you want to choose a cultivar, either June bearing or ever bearing. And so some of the more common cultivars that are suited to our area are listed here. Camino Red is probably the one that I see used the most in kind of pick your own situations for the June bearing ones. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with the ever bearing ones, although San Andreas, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we have some of those at our teaching garden. So European grapes, uh, our wine grapes, as well as most of the table grapes that you get at the store, Thompson seed lists, those kinds of things. This is Betis vinifera. They require trellising. They have heavy disease problems, a lot of fungal issues. The humidity is not really great for them. If you think about some of the better wine growing areas in the world, they tend to be a little drier climate and they do require an extensive spray schedule. And so for that reason, we usually recommend, if you can avoid using these grapes in the backyard, do so. American grapes, on the other hand, are better suited to our climate. There are several different species of American, Native American grapes. The two that are used the most are Labrusca and Rotundifolia. And the Labrusca sometimes have some issues with heat, and as the climate is changing, that might be something to consider. They also require trellising. Well, actually, let me sit back for a minute. You can leave grapes untrellised and let them grow and vine on the ground. But if you do that, you're gonna lose about 10% of your production, and you're also gonna have much more disease and insect pressure. So that's why trellising is recommended for all grapes. So some of the more common cultivars that we look at, Concord, Concord is big, everybody knows Welch's, you know, their grape juice, their jelly is basically Concord jelly. Concord is suited to, to parts of Virginia. Niagara, Delaware, Seneca, and Steuben are also good varieties for Virginia. Now Muscadines are a more southern type of native grape, and these are large globe-shaped grapes. These are, are not as popular, honestly, I'm not sure why, because they have good flavor. They can be used as table grapes. And when I say table grapes, I'm talking about you know, grapes that you just eat. They can be used for jams and jellies. And they can be used for wine. And so if we look at the difference between the two, over here, I believe these are Niagara. I believe that's the variety there. But these are our Arusca. And then over here, we've got the Muscadines. And you can see they're much bigger grapes. I mean, they're almost small plum size, really. And they come in a variety of colors. Actually, both come in a variety of colors. Blueberries are a native to most of North America. We see a lot of our commercial blueberry production is going to be in the North, particularly Michigan, New Jersey, Maine. Blueberry is one of those things that really does best when it has a number of cultivars to cross-pollinate with, although it can, in a lot of cases, be self-pollinating. And typically when we talk about blueberries, we kind of group them by when they flower early, mid-season or late. And so when you're looking at multiple cultivars, you want to make sure that you get them in the same flowering season. And typically you're looking at fruit from June to July. The other thing about blueberries, and one of the things that makes it really good for your home garden, is that blueberries can be an attractive ornamental. You can disguise blueberries as an ornamental, particularly if you have a rather stingy HOA, and get away with it. If you look at the picture in the lower right, you've got high bush blueberries in late autumn, so you see there's a lot of good color for them. The other nice thing about blueberries is they prefer acidic soil, and most of the soil here in North Virginia is pretty acidic, so it works out really well. 
Now, if we look at different types of blueberries, there are basically four species of blueberries that we're looking at. The northern highbush, which we're probably a little bit too far south for northern highbush to do very well. The southern highbush, the rabbit eye, and the low bush. High bushes, both northern and southern, and the rabbit eye, their fruits look pretty similar. The plants look very similar. The rabbit eye fruit is a little less sweet than the high bushes, but otherwise are pretty similar. Um, and depending on where you live and where you're getting or where your supermarket is getting its blueberries from, chances are if you're in the northern part of the country, you're getting them from Maine or Michigan or New Jersey, and they're going to be northern high bush. There are some southern high bush production in Georgia and Alabama. And so you're, if you're deeper in the south, that's more likely what you're going to get. Rabbit eye tend not to be produced commercially. Low bush blueberries are much lower growing. Most of the low bush blueberries I've seen are under 18 inches tall. And depending on what part of the country you're in, a lot of times you can find these growing wild. Uh, this is an understory plant in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, for example. The problem with trying to grow low bush blueberries is you get much smaller fruit. If you've ever gotten one of those blueberry muffin mix where it's got the blueberries in the can, those little small BB sized blueberries, those are low bush or wild blueberries. So most of the time we're looking at southern high bush or rabbit eye blueberries for the backyard. So if we talk about brambles, that's another small fruit that's very popular. These are sometimes called cane fruits and primarily we're looking at blackberries and raspberries. So when we're talking about cane fruits, talk about primocanes, which are the canes that come up that year, and fluorocanes, which are two-year-old canes that came up last year. Our wild blueberries and raspberries are fluorocane varieties, and what that means is they fruit on their second-year canes only. But some of our cultivars are now primocane, and what that means is that they will fruit late in the first year and then fruit the following year as well on that same cane. And so you can increase your production a little bit that way. Problem with the primocanes is that they're a little more expensive sometimes and a little harder to find, although that's changing. The big thing to think about with brambles is that there is no fruiting on three-year-old or older canes. And so those always have to be pruned out. Otherwise, you're just getting vegetative growth that's not really doing anything for you. So typically when we're talking about pruning brambles, the second year canes, after they fruit, prune them down to the ground, regardless of what variety you're using. If you have a primocane variety, then you have an option. With those, the parts of, of the bramble that have fruited, you would prune those off after the fruiting thing, but not the entire cane, because what's going to happen is the cane's going to come up, it's going to produce side shoots, and some of those si side shoots will fruit that first year. And those are the ones that you prune. And that way the rest of the cane will fruit the following year. The other way that you can deal with primocane varieties is you can cut everything down to the ground after they fruit. It's a little more severe and typically we recommend only doing that when you have problems with cane borers or if you have some winter hardiness issues because otherwise you're reducing your fruit production. So looking at the cane berries a little bit more closely, Blackberries, cane fruit belong to the Rubus genus, and there are a number of species of blackberries in the United States. They can get up to 15 feet tall. Trellising is not required, but it is recommended. It makes it a lot more manageable. Got white rose-like flowers that appear in mid to late spring. Typically, the fruit is gonna be a dark purple, although there are some red blackberries out there. They typically ripen in late June into July. Listed here are some of the more common cultivars that are suitable for Virginia, or some are newer genetics than others. You'll see a number of them are named after Indian tribes, and those are typically ones that were developed in the Southwest. Uh, the Primark 45, there are a number of Primark cultivars. They, were, they are um, out of the University of Arkansas. Chester, Kiowa, Natchez, Primark 45. Those are, are pretty good ones, but there are a number of others. 
Virginia State University does a lot of work with blackberries and raspberries, and they are regularly coming out with a list of what they recommend because they're doing variety trials all the time. There are a number of rubus species that are raspberries that are grown here in the U.S., and they have a similar size to blackberries. Typically, you've got, again, white rose-like flowers, same fruiting time period. You've got a much bigger variety of colors and fruit. Most of our raspberry, the traditional raspberry is red, but there are some, some what we call black raspberries that are really dark purple. And then there are some yellow fruiting varieties. Uh, we don't see a whole lot of those on the East Coast, but those are typically used in the West Coast and in commercial production. But some of the cultivars that do well here in Virginia are Caroline, Nova, Heritage, and Killarney. Another berry that looks like the Rubus family but really isn't are the mulberries. And these are actually tree fruits. Unlike most tree fruits, they actually are small fruit. And they grow on medium to small deciduous trees. There are three species that we use for food production. Red mulberry is actually native to Virginia. The Alba and the Nigra are native to Asia. And the red, white, and black really refer to what color is their fruit. Although a lot of times red mulberries will eventually turn uh, kind of purplish. And so with mulberries, if you're not familiar with them, they can be eaten fresh. They're used in jams and jellies quite a lot. The white mulberries are actually dried in Central Asia and eaten that way. And then some people make wine out of mulberries. The leaves of the white mulberry is traditionally the food for silkworm and black mulberries, silkworms will eat, but they won't touch red mulberry leaves. The mulberries have issues. They don't really have a lot of disease issues. Problem with mulberries is that they tend to attract a lot of birds. And with that comes a lot of bird droppings. They also can be a little bit messy. If you look at the picture in the background, you can see that person who's been harvesting mulberries has stained fingers, and that's pretty common of picking mulberries. You're gonna get stained. And again, you know, you've got the bird issue, and quite honestly, sometimes it's a little hard to keep the birds from making a mess of things, either by their droppings or when they pick at fruit, decide it's not ripe and just drop it. A mulberry, particularly the native mulberry, can be a, an attractive, uh, tree in your yard if you've got the room for it. So next we have the elderberry. The elderberry is not really, it's not really a fruit that is grown a lot, although I'm not really sure why. The elderberry, the American elderberry, I should say, there are some European varieties, but the American elderberry is 12 foot shrub. It can sucker some, so uh, you got to be careful and make sure you're keeping it in control, but it's got nice tiny blooms in big clusters, and then it forms these little, slightly larger than BB-sized fruits in clusters that are black, and you usually get the fruit in late summer. This is a native that you may want to consider adding to your landscape. If you've never had elderberries, they're it's got a good berry flavor, just a little bit different. A lot of times when we see elderberries uh, commercially here in the United States, they're used in jams and jellies but they can be eaten fresh and they can be made into wine as well. The American gooseberry has a long and troubled history. So gooseberries and currants are both in the ribes family. And around 1900, they were banned in the United States. And then the reason was that just like with the apple cedar rust, where the cedar rust does damage to the apples, but the cedar is the host, you had a situation where the ribes were a host to a pine fungus. And so to protect the tree industry, gooseberries were banned. And that was lifted, oh, I think 1996, I think it was, that we started to allow gooseberries again. Um, it's hurt the gooseberry and current industry. Don't see a lot of commercial production of either gooseberries or currants. The American gooseberry is more suited than currants to Virginia. They have a, a bit of variety. You can grow them as small trees. You can grow them as bushes. You can grow them as a hedge. The problem with 
gooseberries is they can be easily heat stressed. Um, and so as the climate change, gooseberry may or may not be a good choice in terms of fruit production, um, but it is an attractive plant. The native gooseberry is much more disease resistant than its European cousins. There are a couple of recommended cultivars, Poorman, Captivator, and Pixwell. Gooseberries, if you're not familiar with them, they will, the fruit will get about the size of, of a large grape. So there are other native plants that you might consider, including the American plum and the beech plum. Both of these are shrubs. And while they are stone fruits, which tend to have issues. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning of this, these two are much more resistant to disease because they're native. The beech plum is typically a more eastern coastal plain plant and its lower range runs into the Delmarva Peninsula. Both of these are, are options to consider. They're relatively small. The American persimmon is a small tree. Again, it can be a very attractive tree in your landscape. It produces persimmons that are about the size of golf balls. It's an interesting, the fruit is interesting because it requires frost for the starches to be converted to sugar. And so if you eat a persimmon before it's had a good frost, it's going to be very, very astringent. But it gets very sweet after it gets that frost kiss. Pawpaw is an understory tree. This is if you've got a lot of trees in your yard and you want to grow fruit, pawpaw is something to consider. And if you've never seen a pawpaw, down here in the lower right, these are, these are rather large pawpaw fruits. This is what the fruit looks like when you open it up. These black things are actually seeds and they're relatively easy to get out. It's got a kind of a banana custard flavor to it. Pawpaws are really perishable, so they're hard to get. Even in farmer's markets, they're hard to find. And so if you're interested in pawpaw, if you've had them, if you like them, if you like that banana flavor and you want to kind of grow it yourself, it's a good choice because it allows you to get something fresh without having to worry about, you know, where can I find them? And the University of Kentucky actually is doing a lot of research on pawpaw varieties. The service berry family, they're American and Canadian ones. They can be grown as trees or shrubs. Service berries are typically used in jams. Some non-native fruits to consider, the Asian persimmon. The Asian persimmon, which is the center picture here, is a much larger persimmon. It's about the size of a tomato. It grows fairly well in our climate. Fig, you wouldn't think figs would grow well in Northern Virginia, but they actually do really, really well. Sometimes in a hard winter, they'll get cold damage, but you can just prune that out. A lot of times you can whack the, the fig to the ground and it'll grow right back up. Um, it's a fairly large shrub. It's best to keep as a shrub and keep under control because it's hard to, hard to get fruit on large trees. Two different non-native fruits to consider that we're doing more research on are the papaya and the pomegranate. There's a lot of research going on on papayas being grown in high houses or uh, greenhouses. And they do take, they are tropical plants, so they do take a bit of, uh, a bit of warmth. And so if you've got a sunroom that's large enough and you can bring the plant in or out, or if you've got a garage that you can get it in and out um, during the winter, it's something you might want to consider. Or if you're living to the south and the east of us, papayas can work, especially in the, the mid to lower coastal plain of Virginia. Pomegranates are a little more tricky. Pomegranates are a great fruit. There are two problems with pomegranates. One is the varieties that you can get are Kandahari and Wonder, which are the big red globe ones, which are fine. However, there are lots of different pomegranate varieties. And the bigger ones obviously take longer to develop. The smaller fruited pomegranate varieties, the ones that you can find in the US tend to be more ornamental. And so you don't really get edible fruit or you don't get a lot of prills in your fruit. For some reason, we haven't started importing the medium-sized variety. Uh, there's one there's one that's actually pink and tastes like pink lemonade that the prills are, aren't are hard at all. It's, it's just like a drop of sweet. I'm waiting for that to be introduced. The other problem with pomegranates is sometimes they have some problems with cold. And so if you're 
farther north, farther west in Virginia, that might be an issue, but as climate changes, pomegranates might be an option. It's an attractive little tree, and you know, if you can get fruit from it, that's even a better bonus. Because most pomegranates, I think, are right now are running about three dollars per pomegranate, and that's just silly. The other thing you might want to consider in terms of what can I grow that I can eat, or you might want to consider some nuts. Uh, the black walnut is a very large tree, and if you have black walnuts in your yard, that's sometimes a hassle. But walnuts, if particularly if you prune them so that they don't get quite as big, they can be a, a good nut tree. There are a number of other euglins, which is the genus that black walnuts in, that are native, some of them aren't so native. Again, if they're kept as small trees, they can be decent nut producers. Hazelnuts are actually more of a shrub, uh, which makes them much more suited for your average suburban lawn. Hickories, there are a number of hickories that produce edible fruits. Probably the most famous hickory that's eaten in the United States are pecans. These can be big trees as well, but again, if you prune them correctly and you can keep them short, and have good production. But if you're going to use pecans, you wanna look for short season varieties because pecans like a long, hot summer. And if you're really interested in pecans, 2020 Pecan Festival is coming up in October at the College of William and Mary. Up here, you can see there's a link there. If you're interested, they have, remember how many trees there are on William and Mary. They harvest the pecans and they use it to support student scholarships. When we talk about fruit, one of the things we need to think about is how do we protect them? There are lots of things that like fruit, and sometimes different animals that like fruit like to pick at them when they're not ripe. That reduces your yield as well. And so we need to think about how can we protect them. So repellents are one of the ways that we do that. There are audio repellents. The problem with audio repellents is that animals tend to get used to it and we're talking about loud noises to scare them away. I'm not talking about the ultrasonic things that don't really work at all. Audio can work, you just have to make sure that it, the animal doesn't get used to it. The other problem with audio is that you have to have some system that triggers it. In a backyard situation, you can really annoy your neighbors if you've got loud noises going off all the time, particularly in the evening when some of these animals like to feed. There are mechanical repellents, and these are things like reflectors and reflective tapes that scare the animals. It tends to work with deer and birds or wild rodents don't really care. Animals get really used to it, particularly birds get used to it, and then it doesn't become a deterrent at all. And then there are chemical repellents. The biggest problem with chemical repellents are that there aren't very many of them that are safe for edibles. The other issue with chemical repellents is that they need to be replied fairly regularly. And so that's one more management step. Exclusion is an option, and we're talking about fences and nettings here. The big thing with fences and netting is you want to make sure that the opening size is such that you don't end up trapping other animals that you don't want to, particularly snakes. So the last thing you want to have to do is try and free a snake from it. And so typically we're looking at things that are over an inch in, in spacing or like a fine mesh. If you're having issues with things that fly or climb really well, then you want to make sure you have some sort of overhead protection as well. And so in the background picture here, you can see that they built a little box. It's got chicken wire all around it, and so it's protected from anything getting on top of it. This is more likely used to protect against squirrels. Uh, typically for rabbits, we want to have you know, the vertical fencing, and then we also want to have that fencing go down at the ground level and come out as a little bit of an L to prevent them from trying to dig underneath. Groundhogs the same way, um, although groundhogs are excellent climbers. The big thing with fences and nettings is you want to really design a system with plant maintenance in mind. So again, if you look at the picture in the background, you know, how heavy are those? So if you've got to go in and weed them, you have to take, you have to move the whole thing and that's not going to be terribly convenient. And so you want to design your system so that it is convenient to you being able to get in and out of the weed, to water if necessary, and to harvest. Trapping and removal is another option. It's 
It's an option that gets kind of common. So if you're not aware, at least in Virginia, it is legal to remove wildlife from your property without a permit, which means if you trap an animal and take a step off your property, you've committed a crime. The Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, which used to be the Virginia Department of Game and Fisheries, is responsible for enforcing that, and they don't take that very lightly. And one of the reasons why it's illegal to remove property or wildlife from your property is because a lot of times when we relocate an animal, we're putting it into a new environment, and it's probably an environment where if it's suited to that animal, they're already locals, and they don't take kindly to strangers. And so what's gonna happen is if you take the animal and you put it into a suitable habitat, whoever that territory is, is gonna have a fight to the death with that animal. Um, we see those groundhogs, we see it with squirrels, you know, a lot of times. And so that's not very humane. If you put it in a area that the animal is not really suited to, then the animal is likely going to starve. Again, not terribly humane. So that's really the problem with that, it, with removing it. Now, you can get a permit to do that through Department of Wildlife Resources. I'm not sure how lengthy of a pro process that is, but because of relocation issues, it's going to be an in-depth one. There are some licensed commercial wildlife removal people who have the permission to take wildlife off property those are the people that you probably want to do. You want to probably contact them if you want to try and trap an animal. If you're trapping it on your property, you can either release it back on your property, and if you're in a suburban lot, that's kind of pointless, or you have to humanely kill it, which is not what most people want to do. For those reasons, trapping and removal really aren't good options for most people in a suburban situation. There are lethal options um, that don't involve you actually having to do the work yourself. You use a trap for it or a poison. We recommend against poisons because they tend to harm non-target species. Put a poison out there, a neighborhood dog or cat can pick it up. Beneficial wildlife can get to it. So we really recommend against poisons. The kill traps, the problem with the kill traps is that you have to clean the kill trap after you've used it. Typically, we're looking at snap traps, which are your traditional mouse trap, um, spear traps, which we have on the lower left. They're used for moles quite a bit. Basically, the mole triggers it and the spikes drop down and kill the mole. Um, and then there are scissor traps where an animal comes and triggers it. And the scissor trap, which is up here on the right, this is the trap close. When it's open, the bottom arms look, are spread apart like that. The animal trips it, they snap shut, and bad things happen to the animal. Um, scissor traps, spear traps, and snap traps are pretty much limited to smaller animals and usually smaller rodents or insectivores. So they're not gonna do much against a groundhog or deer. Uh, they're pretty much useless against birds. You know, that it's an option, but it's not always the best option, depending on the situation. Some resources to look at if you want more information, choosing blueberry varieties for the Delmarva from the University of Delaware, small fruits from North Carolina State, small fruit in the home garden from Virginia Tech, trellising systems for, from North Carolina State, and the Virginia State University small fruits page. All of these are excellent resources, um, and if you're still having issues with trying to pick the right fruit or the right cultivar, you can always call us here at the office or email us at mastergardener at pwcgov.org, uh, and we can help you with that. So upcoming Okay, and that's what we're starting with video. Um, Again, Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. We have a couple of add-ons. Um, so they briefly talked about how blueberries can be a decorative fruit, decorative fruit for like HOAs and stuff. If you have very strict HOAs, um, 
So I just wanted to add on to that with some other decorative fruits. Although the ones that I have, you can't exactly eat, but they are still very, very decorative. Um, so although the berries aren't edible, holly trees are beautiful and festive um, little trees to have. They grow well in most areas of the U.S. and can tolerate less than ideal conditions. So if your soil is a bit off in some nutrients, it'll still do well. Um, and holly trees are just very, very beautiful. I have some out in my yard and they are very easy to take care of. Um, some other fruits are like white banberries. Um, they're very decorative um, and they grow in the Midwest and Eastern US, including Virginia. Um, they prefer the clay, they prefer clay-like soils and are usually found in hardwood or mixed forests. Um, so they won't usually be found near um, Virginia's beaches. So yeah. And then the last one is personally my favorite type of berry that I found out about. Um, it's the hearts bursting with love or the American Eastern woohoo berries. Um, they are beautiful red, red Midwest and North American plants. Um, you can find them in parts, the northern parts of Virginia too. Um, it grows in most soils, although it does flourish in valleys and in forest edges. And with Virginia being part of the um, Blue Mountain Range, it's kind of a little rarer to find these, but when you do find these, they are absolutely beautiful. Um, one of the native fruits that they talked about in the video are the um, papaya, no, pawpaw fruits, <laughs> sorry. Um, we are lucky enough to have, to have had um, pawpaw seeds be donated to us. Um, although in research, pawpaw seeds are very delicate and take a lot, a lot of work to grow. Um, you can try your hand at growing them. Again, highly encourage you guys to go up to the box, put your seeds in, take some seeds out, try your hand at, gr at growing a new thing. Maybe you're able to figure out how to grow pawpaws. <laughs> um, yeah, so the video didn't uh, focus a lot on the chill hours map, and I just include this slide because I really feel like this is one of those maps and infographics that's like very important when um, when planning out when to grow stuff, when to plant things, and what to plant where. So yeah, I'm gonna leave this on here. And um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can pause it, look at it again. Um, I will come back to this during the Q&A for anyone who wants to look at it further. Um, now with, um, the, with the chill map, we also wanted to talk about uh, see, the chilling of seeds and delaying the germification of it. Um, usually people will, um, usually seeds will want to delay their germification just so that they can build up all the growth potential and make sure they have the max, they can flourish the most. Um, so some way, there are three main ways that you can like, del that you can chill them. Um, one of the ways is just planting it directly in the ground in the fall or winter. Um, this includes self-seeding plants where, plant where plants or fruits will um, fall off their um, fall off their respective bushes or trees and just bury themselves in the ground for the next season. Um, you can also just do this by hand by um, digging a little trench and then placing the seeds in. Um, you can also do it um, manually by um, putting the seeds in the fridge or the freezer. Uh, you can also do a mini greenhouse where you can control um, the temperature, you can control the temperature at any time, at any point. Um, when it comes to um, chilling seeds, 
when it comes to chilling seeds, what you want to do is you want to make sure you um, read the label or if you are a, if you are um, using seeds that you're buying in a packet, you could, you're going to want to make sure to read the label to make sure if they need to be chilled or not. Um, and then if you're if you're doing if you're doing it based on seeds that you already have, just make sure you do a bit of research to make sure if they need to be chilled or if they need like delayed germification. Now I want to quickly talk about the setup of the fridge freezer method. Um, while the other two methods are pretty much straightforward, with the greenhouse, you're putting it into a greenhouse, you're controlling the temperature of said greenhouse. Um, for the planting method, you're just planting them in the in the fall winter. Um, the fridge freezer the fridge freezer method comes with a bit more research and background knowledge that you'll need to do. Um, some seeds will want to be set up um, warmly and then warmly and wet and then cool down just to just to sort of um, to I, I guess um, just to make sure that they get that late winter late summer feel into fall and into winter. So some of these um, some of these types of foods will include peppers, tomatoes, watermelons. Just make sure you do a um, a sort of late if you're doing it in a greenhouse or if you're doing it um, in fr fridge freezer. Just make sure you give them that time to like cool down and then progressively put them in fridge freezer cold greenhouse um, to simulate to simulate the um, winter months. Um, other seeds will want to like very immediately be cold and wet. Um, these include lettuce, spinach, radishes. Um, I forgot I included pictures. Um, so some seeds will want to very quickly be cold and wet. Um, just, 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 you can, you don't have to progressively get them colder. You can just put them straight into the fridge, put them straight into the freezer, put them straight into a cold greenhouse to start on that um, delayed germification process. Um, the reason why we say that we that um, both want to be wet is they both want to have like a sort of water source. Now they also want a food source too. This food source can obviously has to be decomposable but um, what I do is I put them in um, moistened um, paper towels. I fold them into moistened paper towels um, and then if they need to wait to cool down, I'll let them wait and then we put them in the refrigerator and let them sprout. So on to our typical announcements for today. Um, so we're down to our last recyclable container gardening starter kit for this season. And I am so happy about that. I'm hoping you guys are having so much fun with that gardening kit. It was so much fun to put together. Um, and I'm happy that it's doing so well. Um, we are not going to be restocking this um, due to it being towards the end of the gardening season, the beginning of seeding season. Um, we will probably by um, next month, we will be setting up the um, stuff for seed collections and um, if you want to you want to donate to the um, seed exchange box you can. Um, so again last recyclable container gardening kit, three toilet paper rolls, three mini milk cartons, 11 ounces of dirt that makes roughly a gallon, um, instructions on how to make recyclable pots as well as flies for our future classes. Again the last one is the limit to first come first serve basis so <laughs> so go at it. Um, so thank you all for coming to our 10th gardening workshop. I believe that's all we had for today. Um, Valerie, if you would care, if you care to add on to anything, or if you have any final announcements. 
Um, sure. So I don't have any other announcements here. We did have some other seeds that were dropped off at the seed library. We had some, um, they were not fruit seeds, but they were good um, like flowering plants. We had some Cleome spider flower seeds, um, as well as some other tomato types as well. And um, there was something I just wanted to add on while you were talking about um, the freezer fridge method for seeds. Um, I've purchased several packs of seeds be before and they had no indication as to whether or not they were pre-stratified uh, or needed to be. And if you're not having any luck with your seeds um, after you've planted them and there's no indication on the label, just try to do um, the fridge freezer method and see if that gives you some more success with germinating your seeds because it just might not be labeled that they need to be stratified. But other than that, that was the only thing I had um, to add on to today's video uh, today. Um, great job today, Casey, and thank you so much for everybody who uh, joined us today. We will be okay. posting today's video on YouTube um, with some resources that you guys can check out for more um, small fruits in your home gardens. So, Casey? All right. Thank you, Valerie. Um, so guys, our next workshop is going to be on July 31st. It's going to be hydropon It's going to be the second part of our hydroponics. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I will scroll back to the um, chill maps just because I find those, that maps, those maps so interesting. Um, I will be keeping an eye on the chat. So if you guys have any questions, go ahead and if not, then I believe that is class for the day. Have a great rest of your week, everyone.